Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast. Today, I am joined by Yunus Barisic, who, like, for those of you that know my attempts at surnames, or anyone's names, to be honest, are awful. We've gone through it. He's coached me. He said it was close enough. How do I do? You did well. <laughs> yeah, it's very generous of him. Uh, after I my first attempt, uh, you, you, you said it back. I then tried again, and we're like, no, no just go with your first option. So um, it, it was close enough. Anyway. What we're going to talk about today, as I just said off air, is a topic I really know very little about, which is which is hockey. Uh, for those in the UK, we're not talking field hockey, we're talking ice hockey here. Eunice is a, well, an expert within that field, coaching tons of uh, tons of elite level athletes. Um, so the first question, I suppose, for me is how did you get in to that field, like, you know, specifically strength and conditioning for hockey? How come you ended up gravitating towards that? Okay, I'll give you a short overview. I try to keep the short. So I was a multi-sport athlete growing up as a teenager. Uh, soccer, football was my main sport. Um, but I was always an undersized athlete. Uh, I was decently skilled, but I realized at age 16 that I was never going to make pro because I was weak. I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't explosive enough. So fast forward a few years, I was in college studying business, and I got into lifting, like, for the first time, you know, I found a good program online. I went to the gym, started getting some gains, and I got hooked. And from, from there on, I started training people on the side uh, during my studies. Eventually, I, I even dropped out of uh, college in my last semester because I realized I want to train people. Uh, I did that for a couple of years, trained the general population. And eventually, I realized I want to get into training athletes. And to do, do that, I had to get the CSCS. So I actually went up uh, and went and went back to school, finished up my studies, uh, got the CSCS. Then this was in 2014. I had the opportunity to intern in the U.S. with two great hockey strength coaches. Uh, ben Prentice is the first one. He has his own facility in Connecticut. He trains a ton of uh, NHL players. And he's now with the New York Rangers. And the other one was Kevin Neal, who is now with the Boston Bruins. So from there, after my internships ended, I returned back home to Finland. And I got a job training under 17 hockey players at one of the top two junior hockey organizations in the country. And then as I got more experience and, and the years went by, I got more opportunities. So first year I was training under 17, the under 17 team. And I was also volunteering with the under 20 team. Second year, I got uh, the under 18 uh, teams added to that together with the under 20s. And then my last year, I also got the men's pro team, which was playing uh, in the second highest league in the country at the time. So that was three years after that, I realized I got to move on. So my goal was to create something that I had seen with my internships with Ben and Kevin, where they were running their own off season programs at, at their facilities. So that's what I started doing. I didn't have my own gym. I was training out of a uh, you know public gym, but I was still uh, training my own athletes. And I got quite a lot of interest from, from the guys who had trained with me in the juniors. And then they were taking their next step to go pro D1 college or just, uh, yeah, like to make the jump from the junior level to, to the pros or, or D1 college in the US. So that's how it started for me. And uh, that's what I've been doing for the last four years on my own. Okay. Very interesting. Actually, uh, for me personally, very interesting. I, like, rugby was my sport, but I was undersized, not athletically gifted enough, but quite, quite uh, technically and skillful. Uh, uh, I did business as at university part time alongside my um, my contract with rugby, and then I dropped out of that and went and did sports science. So uh, a few similarities there along the, along the path. There, um, you mentioned the name Ben Prentice. Now, I did quite a long time ago quite a lot of the Poliquin uh, courses, and he's certainly a name that Charles back in the day would reference uh, often, especially when talking about uh, strength conditioning for hockey. And I suppose, like my, like I said, my limited knowledge, um, he, he would be one of the few names 
within the within the field that I I could you know could, could immediately recognize. Um, so maybe could you tell us a little bit about you said you wanted to replicate what he and Kevin had. If you tell us a bit about what their setups like, and then we'll maybe see how you can what, and what you were looking to transfer across into your own setting. Okay, so this was like I said, 2014. Ben was training out of a uh, an ex gas station that he had refitted into a small private gym. So, but he still had like for guys who have, who follow hockey, I, I can just rattle off so, some names. He had Martin Saint Louis, uh, Tori Krug. Chris Kreider, Jonathan Quick, like big, big names. And, uh, but he was training them in a very limited space. So that's uh, kind of interesting. He eventually, a few years after that, he, he uh, got a bigger facility. And I've seen pictures of it, it looks fantastic. But what I wanted to re replicate is that atmosphere and the, the, the quality of, of training that the athletes uh, received. With Kevin, it was a little bit different because his model was small group training. Mm -hmm. whereas Ben was doing one-on-one. -on -one. And I gravitate more toward the small group training as well, but I also didn't want to skimp on the quality of, of the training experience. And, you know, just to give you some background, back home in Finland, the model is that, you know, in the off season, guys get training plans from their clubs, but, you know, there's no structure and there's no accountability like guys do it on their own and then you know who knows if it's going to provide results or not you know and and the other thing is well this is also country dependent and league dependent but in some countries like in finland you only have as an athlete you only have about five weeks to train on your own and the rest of the time you train with the club and, and let's say if he's playing sweden let alone in North America, your entire summer is off. So you go to a uh, strength and conditioning coach of your own choosing and, and you do whatever they tell you. So this is what I, what I wanted to do was to give these young athletes the type of training and, and the experience to help them get to the next level that I just didn't see was available at the time in, back home in Finland. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So we'll get to some, so, you know, what, what was there before and, and what, uh, you know, what maybe what mistakes were being made and how you've uh, helped improve that. But just so I can map this out, how did, so for the guys in Finland, how is their year organized? You said they've got five weeks off, um, but you know, how long's the season? What's the, like the pre, is there a preseason uh, camp type thing? How, how does that all knit together? Okay. So let's start with, with the summer. So usually it, the hockey season starts in, in September and it goes on until April, May, if you, if you go deep in the playoffs. And then there's a preseason that's usually August, which leaves us May, June, July, you know, about three months of off season training. And obviously the guys take a few weeks off after a long season. And so that three months is most of the time it's eight, 10, maybe 12 weeks, okay? So then from, from there, um, can, you, can you go back to the question? I, I kind of lost my train of thought, but. No, no, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, you were giving us just an overview of how the year's uh, yeah. but, but timeline, and then we'll, then we'll maybe delve into the training that they were doing before, you know, what was available before, and then uh, and how you were looking to improve it. But so I've got, September to kind of April, May is the season, depending on how, how, how successful we are, how far you go in the playoffs. June, July is kind of pretty much off and perhaps some of that May time as well. Uh, you know, that, uh, then, then August, you're back into a pre-season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is that, no, so that's, that's in Finland, right? That's the season over there? Yeah. So uh, let's say, let's say you, if you play D1, you usually, you have a little bit longer summer. So you go to camp in September and your season starts in October. And then if you make it to the playoffs and the uh, Frozen Four, the championship, uh, then it's around mid-April is your last game. Okay. So you have, when you do the math, you have about four months or so. And that's the upper limit, basically, if you play college. But pro summers are usually shorter. And the... 
yeah, let's go, let's go uh, forward and you can ask your next question. So okay, cool. I, don't yeah, so, ra- I don't keep rambling too, too no, long that's, here. That's good. So we've got, we've got a good uh, sort of overview of how, how the season comes together and therefore in, in some respects, the limited uh, window of opportunity for you to have uh, some influence. Mm-hmm. So in that off season, you mentioned before they were getting stuff. It was, there was no accountability um, and, you know, the quality of what they were doing in their off season maybe wasn't great. And even if it was, were they executing the plan properly? Uh, and then, you now are starting to sort of plug that gap and improve that quality. I imagine they were, they were doing, well, how, what was the quality of the programming they were receiving? Was it good? Was it terrible? Was it indifferent? No, you, you have to understand that off ice training culture in hockey is, you know, how, how, what do the guys do? Well, usually the strength and conditioning coach at a club is an ex player, you know, who just happened to, maybe they were a good player, but they, probably like to train in the gym and you know then after their career is over they think okay I would like to get into training after these hockey players and you know if you got the status as an ex-pro like there's nobody who's gonna tell you to you know you're not qualified like even if you have not studied this in industry or this field a single day in your life like they'll welcome you with open arms is they think that, well, you are a good athlete, you know the sport, you know how it goes, you know how to prepare, you know, come on in. So that to me, like, already tells you, like, this is not a, an optimal starting point to develop athletes. So uh, as far as programming goes, it, it also has to do with the background of these ex-players who become coaches is, well, they keep repeating the same stuff they used to do back in the day, let's say mm-hmm. in the 90s or early 2000s. And strength and conditioning for athletes has developed and evolved in the last 20, 30 years immensely. So if you're doing that old school stuff in 2021, like you're so far behind, it's ridiculous. So to, to go deeper into what the programs usually look like, well, there's a lot of activity, but there's no progress there's no results and and what players who come to me they always say the same thing like you know i've been training with this trainer for a couple years or i've been doing this club's program and i just feel like i'm not getting ahead like i put my heart and soul into it i train my ass off but i just don't see the results i'll give you an example uh i had a france national team player join me last summer uh, he flew over from france and he trained with me for about 10 10 weeks last summer and after the first training session he told me wow i i realize i've been training the wrong way my whole life you know and and this this guy was a national league, uh, team player he was yeah. he was a pro player so you can imagine so He's been training. What sort of well, what sort of things? I mean, in my mind, I, I imagine I imagine they do some bench press, they do some quarter squats, and they do some bicep curls. I mean, I don't know uh, how how accurate that is, but but what what is the sort of left to their own devices? What sort of training are they getting done? Oh yeah, so that's a big one. The the quarter or half squat. You know, uh, I, I like uh, I see that all the time, and it just really baffles my mind. Like, you know, why can't you do the full range of motion stuff like you're supposed to? Uh, bench press, I mean, some guys don't like it because it's not hockey specific, but you know, it's one of the key movements that most, most of them do and they get tested on. Uh, chin ups, which is a good exercise, but they don't realize that you got to do it weighted like any other strength movement if you want to get stronger. Like if you're doing 15 chin ups, like, where's the strength part? So, uh, you know. That, that's, that one is missing. Deadlifts are usually missing, or if they are done, which is rare, pretty rare. Uh, form is very bad. Uh, power, power cleans are a big movement, but it's all pulling with the arms, uh, not enough hip extension. Um, it's just catch, catch it like a starfish. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's more of the football, uh, football side of things. In hockey, it's not that bad, but uh, okay. you know, the, the execution of the lift and, and it's missing the, the rapid explosiveness and and that like i said mostly arms pulling with the arms and just you know programming it is also like ridiculous like four sets of 10 to 15 reps you know just, which is just basically conditioning with a barbell it's not training the nervous system and so i could i could go on for another hour or two but those are like the big mistakes 
you, you tend to see in hockey. And another, another thing is there is no progression in the program. So it's like, we're going to do this workout today and that workout tomorrow. And then next week, we're going to do maybe something different. Maybe we'll do the same workout, but there's no progression in the weights. There is no overloading. And that's one of the main reasons why guys don't get stronger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So from what I've like you, you said there, it seems to me that most likely you're going to tell me that, you know, they need to actually train for strength. Uh, they mm -hmm. need to improve the quality and maybe, maybe not even uh, reduce the quantity of their training and, and actually seek progression. Seems some like some core things that obviously jump out from, from what they're doing and, Behind those, you know, big things will be some more details. Um, okay, so if you, you know, if we look at an off season, um, your programming, obviously, you know, each individual is different. But um, yeah, well, first of all, actually, I suppose, how are they coming in off the back of a season? How beat up are they? Like, do they tend to be carrying a lot of injuries? Uh, is that you, you find that um, range of motion on certain things is limited because they, they're carrying an injury, or there's right to left asymmetries. Uh, you know, what, what sort of state are they in when they, when they come to you uh, to start the off-season? Uh, well, they're pretty much a wreck, physically speaking. So you, you think that, you know, at the end of the season, because they just played in the playoffs where the best hockey is played, you would think that they're in the best shape of the year. Well, that's not true. You know, uh, after eight, eight, eight months or so of pretty physically intense battle, hard sport, it, you're just going to be a train wreck. So what I see a lot is uh, they lost muscle mass during the season. They lost strength. They lost their speed and explosiveness. They gained body fat. So without fail, the guys are skinny fat at the, at the end of the season. Many of them have injuries. Some have to get surgeries. Um, their diet completely sucks. Their sleeping habits are out of whack, especially in North America and the NHL when, when you have to cross so many time zones. Yep. Um, what else? They're uh, vitamin and mineral deficient because they haven't supplemented throughout the season. And obviously, you know, you play hockey in the winter, maybe except for California or Florida or Texas, but you play in, in a cold climate, so you don't get vitamin D from the sun. Uh, so those all affect your performance and, and how you feel overall your mood and energy levels then um, training wise we see a lot of anterior dominance because hockey is played a lot you, they're basically com a bunch of computer nerds you know with their uh, posture slouch forward and, and hips flex because that's the typical hockey position or hockey stance so we got to get them out of that um, so th that's basically what we're dealing with Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the off season okay so uh skinny fat weak slow uh poor diet bad sleep uh anterior dominant people coming in um mm -hmm. that's that's sort of you know that that's the avatar that's that's what you're working with so how often um are typically are they uh in the gym training in the off season um how are you structuring their training week uh and then maybe right. we'll, we'll take it from there yeah perfect so with me, I have a four day off season template and this has evolved over the years. Uh, it used to be three times per week for beginners, full body, and then for the more advanced players, four times per week, upper body. Now I just have moved pretty much exclusively to a four times per week push pull routine. So day one, you do some kind of squat, you do uh, push ups, bench press. So pushing motions and second day you do a deadlift chin up bro and so on and you do that twice per week and then if I'm dealing with a younger or a skinnier guy who needs to beef up in the upper body as well then I will add a fifth session which is more upper body work directly for the chest delts biceps and triceps because a lot of guys simply don't have that upper, upper body muscle mass they lack they lack uh the body armor so to give you an idea how it how it goes over the summer well phase one is basically our uh, you know, bodybuilding phase we're building the guys up uh, longer time and attention higher reps incomplete rest periods and we just want to get guys back to back to that kind of 
condition where we can actually put some weight on the bar eventually. So if we skip this, they won't be ready for the heavy lift. And, and so we do, we hammer the posterior chain a lot from the upper back through the lower back, glutes, hamstrings. And then we do a lot of single limb work, you know, mm -hmm. one arm rows, we do split squats, lunges, um, one leg RDLs, back extensions to balance them out, not just front to back, but also side to side, because hockey is a lopsided sport. So there's going to, there's going to be imbalances created over the season. We try to negate that. And then let's go deeper into how my off season programming looks like, like I said, phase one is more of a base building approach. We're building the guys up Then phase one, we go into strength, basic strength work with, uh, fives on the main lift. So we do weighted chin up, barbell, barbell bench, trap bar deadlift, squat. And then I have two ways to go from there. After the second phase, we might go linear. So after the second phase would be a max strength phase, which is a three ways, a three week cycle. First week is triples. Second week is doubles. Third week is singles. And you, you know, that third week you work up to your, one RMs for the summer. And if we still have some time, let's say two, two, three more weeks after that, before sending them to camp, we have a power phase. And with that, we lighten up the load, we go sub maximal and we focus on bar speed. We use bands, chains, contrast training, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the linear approach. And then it, the other one is an undulating approach. So after, the, the first strength phase where we had fives on the main lifts, we would do phase three, which is again, a higher volume phase. And here we could do more eccentric emphasized work, isometric emphasized work, or just plain, you know, higher reps or some kind of, you know, special techniques that prolong time under tension, just to have a couple more extra weeks to build that muscular foundation before then going to the max strength phase with the triples, doubles, and singles, and then eventually the power phase at the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Yeah, so I think that base building phase, uh, crucial. I mean, I, I don't know with hockey players, but even with just helping guys to build muscle mass, fixing some of those imbalances, that structural balance component is is fundamental and, and like really uh, lays the foundations for what's gonna come. So that makes perfect sense. I'll, I'll have, you, I have some more specific questions for you on that. Uh, interesting about the linear or the undulating. So uh, what sort of goes into the de decision making of this, this guy's going to go linear, this guy's going to be undulating. Is it more, if they need more muscle mass, we're more likely to bias the undulating approach uh, as opposed to the linear approach? Yeah, so that's the fa factor number one is, like you just said, if they need more lean muscle mass, then we got to do more high volume work. You know, there's no way around it. And the, the second factor is time. You know, let's say I have a player for nine weeks, then linear three, three week blocks makes sense. That's nine weeks. But let's say we have someone for 13 weeks, which I consider luxury, but mm -hmm. sometimes it happens and it's good. So then we can do three, three, three. So that's nine weeks. So, uh, and then the max strength phase, phase four would be two, would be two weeks and then two weeks of uh, power. So then we have five phases together, 13 weeks when we pretty much hit all the notes that I want to hit over the summer and we don't leave any stone, stone unturned. So I have found that even if it's only three or four more extra weeks, but to be able to slot that second high volume phase in there, uh, that, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, that and makes so, a, lot, so, a lot of sense. Yeah, so coming back to what we were talking about before is because sometimes you know, the players only have a few weeks to train on their own during the summer and the rest of the time they have to do the, the club's program. I mean, I, I really don't like that. So I would prefer to work with the athletes that have a full summer off and then we can really, you know, do what they, you know, what they need to, to do to keep, better, to keep getting better. So um, sometimes I do have the players who come to me for five weeks and we still make gains that's that's for sure but it's still a very very limited time frame and it, you know it it gives you some some headache as a coach 
And, and to be honest, like, it's not easy because there have been some very, um, there have been many, many nights where I, I, I haven't been able to sleep because I'm thinking like, how am I going to make this guy better in five weeks with, with uh, the baseline he has, which is not very good mm, mm. to begin with. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, I guess I think the point is, uh, no matter how good your programming is um, and how hard they work, you know, whatever, whatever physical outcome you're, you're chasing, it, it takes time. It's none of these are an overnight fix. So uh, there, there is, you know, even if you have everything perfectly in place, there's only so much you can do in five weeks. Um, Absolutely. So, so that time limited um, element is something else that I wanted to ask about. So, you know, obviously you, you mentioned they come in, they're pretty, they're like a bit of a train wreck. They're beaten up. Uh, then, then, you know, they may have uh, muscular imbalances in terms of strength, but they may also have movement quality limitations, uh, various issues. Now, assessing all this, how, how do you go about that? Because presumably to some extent, you're like, well, we want to start making progress, but I also need to be able to know exactly what I'm working with. So do you have a, a specific assessment process you take them through? Or is it a case if I get them in a the gym and I've got my coach's eye and as they're moving, I'm constantly uh, reassessing and, okay, see, this, this is looking, you know, something needs addressing here. That's good. This is bad, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, back in the day when I was... Starting out, I would use the FMS, Functional Movement Screen. But what I noticed after running about 100 players through it is I could tell the same deficiencies with my own eyes that I got from the test. So eventually I scrapped it. And so these days, basically, I have two or three tests. The first one is they take their shirt off and I just look at them. You know, like, first of all, I can tell like, if they have any muscle mass, uh, I can accurately guesstimate their body fat percentage starting point and then i can tell if they have severe muscle imbalances side to side like let's say one one shoulder is drooping and, and or something like that so uh, the second thing is you know i put them on a scale and if i'm working with them in person and not not through online coaching i take uh, body fat measures with a caliper and then we also track their waist circumference we track their chest arms legs so and this happens weekly over the summer so, because this gives me objective data mm -hmm. uh, how, the, how the program is working and if we need to uh, adjust things and but the big thing is really just what goes on in the weight room like uh, a, a good one that i find a lot of value in is the overhead squat if they can do it with an empty barbell uh, a lot of them can't because their ankles are locked up uh, so by raising the heels and then they usually can go down and then I can, I can tell that, okay, you know, your, your ankles, we need to work on that. And, um, so that's a big one. And then, then just the entire training process in general, you know, after you have been doing this for a while, you tend to see the same mistakes and imbalances and deficiencies over and over again. So it's just like a car mechanic, you know, once you've seen, how to fix an engine and you've done it a hundred times. Like it's the same process every time. Yeah. So th there, there isn't really that much stuff that is new or, you know, puts you out of whack when it, when it comes to how they move or what they can do. Um, a lot of times their technique is really not dialed in because they haven't been coached properly. And I mean, they, you know, from the club, they get a program that says, three times eight squats, but you know, it doesn't matter what the paper says. I want to know how you do it, if you can do it well or not. So that, that's a big thing. Uh, if we want to go a little bit deeper, uh, upper back work is very, very neglected. So when you look at them, some guys might have decent chest development, arm development, if, especially if they're the kind of chest and arm kind of player, but you know, upper back, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And you can tell, like, from their posture, you know, like I said, this slouch forward, there's nothing to pull that posture back into, into a straight uh, position. Uh, and they really don't know how to have an efficient mus mind-muscle connection. They don't know how to retract the shoulder blades and make those smaller muscles work. Uh, that's a big one. Also, hamstrings, glutes, lower back, posterior chain, is very, very neglected, which is a huge part of skating or sprinting and 
how fast you're gonna go on the yeah, ice. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I, like, I've never, never been. Yeah, you know, I've ice skated, but never to a good standard. But it, it seems to me that immediately I'm like lower back, glutes, hamstrings. You, those guys need to be strong. It seems obvious, but um, you know, obviously, obviously not, not obvious enough. No, not. And, and hockey players are very quad dominant because the skating action it mm. develops quads. So if you look at guys and you tell them to roll up their, you know, shorts. Uh, you can tell that that many have pretty good quad development, but then you tell them to turn around and, you know, let's see the other side. You know, there's no butt and there's no hamstring. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's unfathomable, actually, like how you can be a, a good athlete in your sport, but you're just so out of whack, muscularly speaking. Uh, so we hammered that with a lot of volume. Like uh, what I like to say is we, we transform pancake asses into real hockey butts. That's <laughs> what we do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, there's, there's a few things again, I want to just touch on there that I thought were really good. So uh, when you talked about how, you know, that you, you, you can see it with your own eyes, but there's, there's not so much that's different. It's like something often I end up telling clients is look, you're special, but you're not that special. Like mm -hmm. we, we're all within uh, a spectrum here of like, you know, that, that especially the guys I train, you know, they have, a lot of crossover with the similar issues they have and, and likewise with, with the hockey guys you get. Um, and then you talked about, you know, how are they actually performing the workout they're given and how are they executing that? And we talked about, you know, if you only have five weeks, if you can suddenly get every set or every rep of every set being much more efficient at recruiting and challenging the muscle, it's, you know, the movement path it's supposed to do, well, there's how you can get a big impact in, in only five weeks because They'd, otherwise, they'd have done five weeks of you know worthless training. Now they actually get five weeks of productive training. So, I, I thought that was an interesting point about making them do the, do the stuff properly. And then uh, one question I had talked about the posterior chain and how quad dominant they are because of the skating action. In many respects, it seems to me your role might be actually working what the sport doesn't to avoid that kind of overuse uh, and dominance becoming a, an injury down the time down the line. Because if they just reinforce their quad dominance. Uh, I, I imagine there's, you know, there's a fairly high risk of injuries as a result of that, that imbalance becoming too big, too wide. All right. It, it's a good thing you touched on that topic. Um, knee injuries are not that, uh, not that big of a, of a problem in hockey, but what is a big problem is hip injuries mm -hmm. and, and lower back injuries. And well, if you're in a hip flex position, all the time on the ice and you never get out of that position uh, through hip extension, then you're gonna create those imbalances. The second thing is you can make it even worse in the gym with quarter squats, half squats, which is pretty much all that they do. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you really well put it, it's anti-hockey specific training, so to speak, even though all the coaches and all the players, they think, oh, we need to be hockey specific. And I said, no, we, we, we just gotta make you a better athlete overall. Mm. And that, that includes, uh, you know, training areas which are neglected during the season and, uh, and are neglected in, in, in your sport. So, I mean, yeah, well put. Okay, cool. Uh, actually, quickly, uh, in terms of injuries, is like a sports hernia, is that something that comes up quite often in hockey? Uh, like or like a, a, an adduct, a high adductor strain type situation? Mm -hmm. Uh, again, just, just yes. visualizing the motions, I imagine that's something that could happen. Yeah, uh, hernia is a big one. Uh, another one is uh, just adductor strains. And over 90% of them, based on research, are non-contact injuries mm, in nature. Okay. And there is actually very, very interesting research on this. So uh, if your adductors are 80%, the strength profile of your adductors is 80% or less of your abductors, then you have a 17 times higher risk of having an adductor strain. Wow. So, so th this is uh, why you also need to get stronger on single leg exercises because the adductors come into play big time there. And with guys who have had adductor problems in the past, we do, you know, adductor prehab work like Copenhagen's yes, and, exactly. and, and okay. stuff, like, stuff like that. So, you know, it, it's this, these are things like nobody in the hockey community, at least in Finland or in Europe, uh, nobody talks about this because they don't know about it. It's just quarter squats and bad power cleans and bench presses and that's it. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so up, I mean, it seems to me upper back, posterior chain, single leg, what, like Bulgarian split squats, for example, or some kind yes. of split squat. And then Copenhagen planks, you're, you're probably going a long way to filling in what most hockey guys need at the end of a, a tough season uh, in some respects. And, and it is, I think the way that you describe how you, you sequence uh, the phases is really interesting, gives people a, re- a really good oversight on that. Um, now, I know what I mentioned, I want to talk about the energy systems as well. So we'll, mm. uh, we'll, we'll so if we pivot and transition a little bit there, um, can you describe, well, the energy systems that are, are stressed uh, within uh, you know, uh, uh, hockey and, and therefore what needs, uh, what capacity they need, and then how you go about weaving that in uh, to their training, um, if at all, and, and when during the season? Or, or, or yeah, okay. the, the year rather than just the season. Okay. So it's probably going to be easier if we start with the off season mm-hmm. because in season is different, but um, okay. So hockey is primarily an interval based sport. So uh, anaerobic. And if you look at what kind of player is dangerous on the ice, well, it's somebody who is very explosive on the first few steps who can change directions fast. We call it, you know, changing directions on a dime and just exploding off that uh, deceleration into acceleration. And then someone who can repeat that over the entire game. So repeat sprint ability is big. So I would say that the hockey community is still stuck in the 1980s, 1990s paradigm of conditioning. First thing, when you say hockey conditioning, they think of long distance running, jogging in the off season and then stationary bike in the winter. And uh, I take a completely different approach. My number one conditioning tool is the sled. I don't think there's anything that can replicate it, you know, not just for the conditioning, but also it's very similar to the hockey, hockey stands or skating position. And you, you build the legs in a way that no other tool or piece of equipment can. Also, other benefits of sled work are, you know, the stress on joints is minimal and nervous system stress is minimal. So you can do that frequently and there's not going to be any lagging uh, fatigue from that. And it's pretty much injury free. Like I've never seen or heard anybody hurting themselves by doing any kind of sled work. Uh, Whereas with jogging, uh, I'll give you an, an, an idea of what we're dealing with here. There are top clubs in Finland where they instruct the players to jog for seven, uh, between seven and 10 hours per week. And wow. that's, a lot of, that's a lot of volume for guys who are, like ho- hockey players in general, they are not made for long distance running. They are a bit heavier. And you know, also they don't have very good technique because their sport doesn't consist of running. You know, it's completely different skating. So what, what I see is guys who do a lot of high volume running, is shin splints and knee problems and also sometimes hip and back problems. So when I do the risk reward ratio profile between sleds and jogging, it's a no brainer. Um, So that would be uh, from the conditioning perspective. Also things like tempo runs and jumping rope, very, very good. Um, Then what else? Uh, Another area where my ideas differ differ from the masses is I like to condition through small area games. You know, Mm -hmm. let's face it, like athletes are athletes and they love to compete. They love to play. So anytime you have a ball that you kick or throw or strike and you can make a game out of it, they're going to be full in. So we're talking about uh, football, basketball, handball, tennis, floorball, anything that involves a ball and, chasing after it and keeping score so you can claim victory. I mean, that, that, that really fires guys up. And not only that, but it's fun and you get a training effect without it feeling like, oh, I have to do another work again. Yes. So there's a me- mental aspect as well. Yeah, one of my old rugby coaches used to call it camouflage conditioning. Uh, yeah. So he'd set up a game and there'd be specific rules that in- meant that, I know there was more space on the pitch, more running involved, but because, like you say, you give people that are athletes some things to keep score on and fatigue, the by and large goes out the window and they'll, they'll put 100% in. Whereas if you tell them, oh, yeah. all right, you're, you're sprinting, you know, another, another 60 yard sprint with a 
two minute recovery or whatever, you know, like they, they get built bored of that pretty quickly. So I think that's a great idea. Uh, really interesting that, uh, that you incorporate that with, with various different sports as well. Um, and so I'm, I imagine that they love that, but by the same token, they, they get great benefit from it without even realizing. Oh, for sure. I, uh, a big hit when I was with the junior hockey club, a big hit was always football, soccer, because the guys love it. And then now with the a little bit older players, I found that tennis is great, you know, okay. two against two. I mean, singles is fun, but if it's two against two, there's a little bit of uh, teamwork involved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's even more fun. So, yeah. Okay, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great idea. I can definitely see the benefit there. Um, so, with, okay, let's look at the sled because I, I, I'm a big fan of the sled as well. Um, so, you're pushing it, are you pushing it, you're dragging it, are you doing lateral sled work? Is, you know, uh, how, how, are we, how are we doing that? Are we doing all of that, some of that? Yeah, well, uh, there's basically three ways to do it. You can do forward, backward, or sideways. And uh, I, would, I would say most of the time we do forward and backward. And then for hockey, uh, you know, lateral movement is also important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've found that if you do lateral strength work with the sled, it, you know, it, it's hard to magnify how much it helps, but it, it mimics the, the crossover action in hockey. So there is definitely some benefit to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Logically, just picturing that again, I can say, okay, I, I feel like there's probably some transfer here. Um, it's interesting to see that that you're using it, you know, it's hard to quantify exactly how much, but you think it's beneficial. So, okay, so in terms of challenging uh, the energy systems on the sled, where are we looking sort of, uh, you know, anaer anaerobic capacity type work on, on the sled, uh, or is there some power uh, base work as well, utilizing that, uh, you know, obviously you will program things differently based on the needs of the individual, but uh, how, how, you know, how's a, an example sled uh, session come together? Okay, so it depends on uh, which phase we are in the off season. So let's say we're early in the off season. I like to do longer, you know, up up to sixty, even one hundred meters. This is my aerobic sled work, you know. And when when you think of it, like the first image that comes to mind is like, oh, like that that must be brutal, like travel fluid and all that. But we would go really light with the weight, so it might be just a single twenty kilo plate on on the sled and you're just basically walking. And the goal is to raise your heart rate, but not, not go lactic, because mm -hmm. we're training the aerobic system. Yes. And then, and then eventually as the summer progresses, then we shorten the distance, then we go more anaerobic. And then uh, if we want to do it as a strength move, we might do five to 10 meters. Then if it's more anaerobic, might be 15 to 30 meters. And uh, obviously, the rest periods have to also reflect the, the goals of mm -hmm. the training yes. session, but that that's like the overall overview. Okay, so uh, by and large, the the sled work kind of follows a linear pattern through the through the time frame in terms of uh, coming from longer duration, higher yeah, volume. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, interesting. Uh, I, so sled work, obviously, um, you know, kind of like strongman type thing. But uh, do you use any other strongman type exercises with uh, with the athletes? Yeah, so here's the thing with strongman stuff. I, I like it. Uh, it's always, it comes down to what kind of equipment you have available. So if you train in a public gym, you probably <laughs> don't have a yoke. You probably don't have farmer's handles, but you can still use a trap bar or dumbbells. But it's still, it's a different, uh, different setting uh, versus if you were training in a real powerlifting or strongman gym where you have, you know, all kind of different equipment available. So as much as I like that stuff, I always, I always have to be realistic and think what, what do these guys have available? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. of course, yes, that makes sense. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So again, I, when we discussed this before, uh, another thing I want to talk to you about was the mindset. So uh, mm -hmm. of the athletes and their buy-in again, so we'll go with a stereotype that probably was largely informed by my courses way back in the day on the, on the follow-up and stuff, but you know, it was that the hockey guys, like they played hard, they partied hard, and then in the off season, they weren't that interested. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but the ones that were set themselves, like took it more seriously, they were the ones that really separated themselves from, from the other guys. Um, is, so first of all, I suppose, is that stereotype fair and accurate of what you see? If it is, is it changing? Um, what, what's, what's it like with the guys you work with? I would say there is definitely an element of truth behind that and you know the basic 
off-season hockey diet is beer, pizza, and ice cream. Yes. <laughs> but at the same time, I will say that at least based on my understanding, it is, it's slowly changing. So the current generation, they are not really into the parties and boozing it up that much. I mean, sure, if you're in college, that is involved. Uh, that goes with the territory. But, you know, it's not like, whereas in, back in the day, you after a game, you'd go straight to the bar and have six six beers. I mean, that, that doesn't really happen anymore. But in the summer, the guys let loose and, you know, there is some, some alcohol involved for sure. Uh, I think I'm pretty fortunate that the players who seek me out, they tend to be better in this regard. So they take it more seriously. So when I tell them, you know, if you want to be your best uh, version, then there's no room for alcohol and, and, and all the junk food that the other guys are eating. There's no room for that in your diet. And fortunately, they listen. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, by the fact that they've reached out to you, they're kind of self-selected. They're already driven enough that they understand that sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So you, you, you work with these guys. Uh, obviously, we talked a lot about the work that's going on in the off-season. They go back to their clubs. Um, are you still involved with their programming during the season? Or when they're back to their clubs, is it kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're off on their own and, uh, you know, the, sort of well limited by whatever the club's telling them yeah. to do so it depends sometimes i'm lucky and the player is lucky uh, in that the, the the club and the trainers they see that oh after the summer he spent with me he came back in great shape and they let me still run his in-season program which i think is very nice of them uh and definitely not the norm but in the majority of cases they have to do what the team tells them to do and like I said it's really far from optimal uh, and here's the thing too the hockey training world there is really no in-season training culture I mean don't get okay. me wrong people they, they still go to the gym but you know there is no progression and, and, and a ma mantra that they keep parroting is well uh, in season you can only hope to maintain whatever you gained in the summer so let's just focus on maintaining and they don't even think about, okay, you could actually get better. Mm -hmm. And well, if you, if you look at the big picture, like I said, off season might be just three months. And so what are you doing the rest of the year, the, the remaining nine months? Like if you're not getting better, somebody else is. Yes. So you're falling behind. And, and to, you know, with, with that backdrop, with the, with the players who train following my programs, we live twice per week and it's full body. And there's always an element of progression in it. I mean, optimally, I would love to see your strength levels increase over the season. Sometimes it doesn't happen, especially the higher the level of play is. I mean, because that always comes along with, with more, more games and more travel. So, you know, you don't have that much energy for the gyms, but for the gym training. But in, in all my years of doing this, I mean, you should get better over the season. There's just no question about it and if you if you don't like it makes me wonder like what are you doing yeah yeah exactly so that's that's a good mindset for them to be in but you know as you say like you know nine months season that three quarters of the year if you're not actively trying to get better then almost certainly uh you're, you know you're going backwards probably not even maintaining um so you're they're lifting you know if they're with you they're lifting twice during the off season uh, per week uh, what's um what's the schedule like for these guys how often do they play um and you know what, is there some sort of downtime uh, within the season? You know, uh, mm. like say, for example, in football or, or soccer, like in a lot of European leagues, they'll have a mid-season break. Is there anything like that? Or do they just go the whole way through? All right. So the schedule is typically two to three games per week. And depending on the league, weekends tend to be more heavily game involved. Uh, and some, some leagues are more evenly spaced out. So you might have a game on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Uh, so if, it's, if, if your games are Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, then you have a couple of extra days in between to you know, do your workouts at the, at the start of the, the week or even on Sunday. But if you play Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you know, it's pretty much the only way to do it so that you have enough recovery before the next game is to lift, lift straight after a game. And you can really only do that after a home game because if you're on the road, you, know, you, you might not have access to a gym. And if you have, you don't know what, what's available. 
So that, that's one, one way to program it during the season. And then you were asking about the breaks. I think the biggest or the longest break in most, at least European leagues, is about two weeks around Christmas and New Year's. So it's not really that long. But there are a couple of one-week breaks uh, during national, uh, international tournaments. So, you know, it depends on the player. If, if guys are feeling good, and we might, we might lift three or four times that week, but most of the year or most of the it's during the in-season, it's two times mm -hmm. per week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, lots of juggle. And as you said, their recovery is paramount so they can perform well. Uh, and so, so, you know, balancing that, uh, with their workload, you know, on the ice, but also the travel is, is definitely... Oh, for sure. And, and let me just uh, uh, inject something real quick in there. So what a lot of times players have this mindset that oh, I cannot really lift heavy during the season because then my legs will be too sore for the games and my performance will suffer. Well, then you look at what they're doing in the gym. Well, they're doing too much volume, first of all, and their frequency is too low. So they train legs just once per week. And so what's going to happen? You, you're not accustomed to the workload and obviously muscle damage is going to be higher. Whereas if you train twice per week, lower volume per session, you would have no issues. So these are the things I have to deal with. It's not optimal and it's not easy trying to change the mindset of uh, players who have been told that, well, you can't, first of all, you shouldn't expect to get better over the season. Second of all, I mean, you shouldn't push yourself too hard. And third of all, um, you know, don't, don't push yourself too hard because otherwise your performance on the ice will suffer. So it's, it's not easy. Yes. Yeah. Lots, lots to balance there. And I imagine again, depending on the individual, um, whether you're pushing them to do more or holding them back is again, uh, probably very, very dependent upon them. I'm sure there's some guys that, uh, they 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 sort of work horses and they, they, they enjoy getting in and they'll, they'll do too much if you don't pull them back. Mm. Whereas some other guys need a bit of a nudge to, to get in and do the work. So that's, that's where, you know, really good quality coach kicks in uh, and gets the most from the individual. Oh yeah, um, for sure. And, 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 you know, I, I'm pretty fortunate in that the guys who seek me out, I mean, they are motivated, so I don't really have to kick them in the butt. Uh, so I'm, I'm more, more or less with the real work horses. I have to like tell them to you know, scale it back a little bit. You know, you know, you don't need to go that hard all the time. Like let, let's recover for a bit and then, then go, pedal to the metal again, but not 24-7. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Fine line. It's a difficult one. Oh, my, my, I turned off my uh, notifications yet. They're still coming through there. Um, yeah, fascinating. I always think when you get around to talking about in-season uh, training, you know, strength and conditioning, it's, it's such a tricky, a tricky thing. Whatever the sport, um, especially with these sports where you have a high frequency of, uh, of matches. So, for example, like, you know, like I said, playing rugby, you very rarely would ever play more than one game a week. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, hockey, um, I, I figured the, the schedule would be a bit more like that. But again, like, you know, basketball, for example, that baseball they play so often, how, how you, you sort of sneak this, this work in to, as you say, to make sure that they improve through the season is, is such, a, such a tough one. I, you know, I have it easy. I just work with people that, you know, have regular jobs. Uh, so we manage their work stress, but they haven't got the, the, the physical stress on, on top as, as well to, to concern ourselves with. So, yeah, we we'll always find that very interesting. Um, we're sort of running up on time here. So, as I said, we've got uh, some quick fire questions, completely mm. aside from the world of strength and conditioning, but uh, we'll get to find out quite how food focused I am with these questions. Uh, so, either or, um, pizza or burger? Burger. Chocolate or peanut butter? You know, I, I really don't get the obsession about peanut butter, so chocolate. Most of the European, uh, so, well, basically, if you're not, if you're not American, uh, you, you kind of, they always go like, oh, I'm not really fussed about peanut butter. Okay, uh, beach holiday or a city break? Beach. Yeah. Uh, okay, steak rare or well done? Rare. Uh, and then last one, uh, eggs, scrambled or poached? Scrambled. All right, I, I like, I, I, I was... I was told by someone else that I gave the game away when like, people answered. I kind of like reflexively shook my head or nodded. But I think you got all of those answers right. Even <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree with all of those. Um, all right. Uh, so before we uh, give you a chance just um, to let, let people know a little bit more uh, about you and um, where they can find out your stuff, I've got two questions. First one is, can you tell me something about you that people probably don't already know? Hmm. 
All right, let me let me think for a minute. Yeah, this is the one. This is the one that always gets people. I always have to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it's a sort of a sort of fill for a, a few seconds while people uh, people think about what, yeah. what so skeletons this, they've this got. This one in is this one is kind of hockey related, but not really. Uh, well, I'll just tell you. So when I was a kid, you know, most kids they will spend their allowance on candy, right? So I spend my money on hockey cards. I oh, collected really? cards. Yeah, you know that was a big thing back in the in the '90s. Me and a few few of my childhood friends, we we did that. And when you tally up the amount of money I spend on those cards, <laughs> in hindsight, you, you recognize it probably wasn't that good of an idea. I mean, you could have spent <laughs> or invested that money a lot more wisely. And and I still have that collection somewhere in my storage and thousands of cards it would be interesting to see what the value of those cards is today i mean if they even have a value or if that's like yeah that money is gone that's where that's where you go and you find you got an ultra rare one and actually it was all it was all worth it after all um, yeah. I, I saw a lebron james card or something like uh, went for a ton of money lately so you, you have to hope you stumble across uh, i don't know like again showing my lack of hockey knowledge like some kind of wayne gretzky um mm. Uh, original or something anyway okay interesting uh yeah maybe well maybe it'll turn out to be a great investment we'll find out watch this space uh, so final question for me is um if i have access uh in a you know, diary or an address book to to anyone in the world who should i interview next who should you interview next uh well for your male followers i would think cristiano ronaldo would be <laughs> yeah that'd be a good one <laughs> yeah good one uh, i i bet he would have a lot of interesting stories <laughs> yes i'm sure i'm sure there would be uh, be a fair few uh quite often yeah so obviously i'm hoping you have a uh, have his have his phone number so i can drop him a text and invite yeah, him on the show i, I did have it but uh, you know i changed phones and i lost oh, it so yeah, no, there we fair, go fair enough fair enough <laughs> good excuse um all right so it's been a pleasure talking to you. I found that really, really interesting. And I think that this is well, have got a ton of value and a really good insight into what goes into uh, coaching, you know, hockey players and, and, and different uh, issues that you face. So please take a moment now just to let everyone know where they can find out a little bit more about you, the services you provide, if they're, if they're interested in um, reaching out and working with you. All right. So the best place to contact me is my Instagram. My handle is at... Yunus Barisik, so Y-U-N-U-S-B-A-R-I-S-I-K. And then uh, I also have a book book out, Strength Training for Ice Hockey, uh, physical book, uh, which you can check out at hockeystrengthbook.com. And it's the most research-based, most detailed book ever written on the topic of strength training for hockey. So if you are a hockey player or hockey coach, strength coach who deals with hockey players or a hockey parent, definitely go check it out okay cool we'll make sure we get the uh, the links to both of those your instagram and Thank that you. book in the in the show notes so everyone go check those out and uh, and learn a little bit more uh you know so thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat tonight um I've, I've really enjoyed it and uh, maybe we'll get back on a on the show another time for for another conversation about some uh, some other topics absolutely thank you for having me tom this was a very interesting chat thank you <laughs>